Hello. Let me now turn to the second stage of Baha'i expansion from the 1890s through to the early 1950s, which was marked by the pronounced internationalization of movement. This period covers the whole of Abdul Baha's period of leadership of the Baha'i faith from 1892 until 1921, and the major part of the leadership of his grandson and chosen successor, Shaqi Effendi Rabani. During the early years of Abdul Baha's leadership, a major change occurred in the nature of the Baha'i community as it broke out of the cultural confines of its traditional Islamic milieu and became a truly international religious movement. This process continued under Shaqi Effendi, such that by 1952, there were Baha'is in some 116 countries and major colonial territories, including quite remote areas such as Greenland and the Bismarck Archipelago of New Guinea. The total number of Baha'is remained small, however. Baha'i demographics are notoriously uncertain. My own, very provisional estimates, are that by the 1890s, the total number of Baha'is worldwide may have been in the region of 100,000, and it is possible that this number may have doubled to around 200,000 by the early 1950s. Nevertheless, even though the majority of the Baha'is, almost undoubtedly over 90%, were still Iranian, a major cultural shift had occurred, and the cultural adaptability of the faith and its potential to attract a wide diversity of peoples had been vividly demonstrated. Of key importance in this transformation was the establishment of the Baha'i movement in the West from 1894 onwards, a development I will describe in more detail in later videos. Although small numbers of non-Muslims had already become Baha'is in the Middle East, they had done so in an Islamic cultural environment many of the values of which they themselves shared. By contrast, in the West, the Baha'i religion was something alien. A cultural gap had to be bridged if the faith was going to gain followers. Significantly, the pioneer Baha'i teacher in the United States was a recently converted Syrian Christian, Ibrahim George Khairullah, who was able to express his own version of the Baha'i teachings in a way which appealed to Christian sentiment. Subsequently, the newly converted American Baha'is, followed by a smaller number of Europeans, played a major role in reformulating the Baha'i teachings in Western and Christian terms, composing their own introductions to the faith, often quoting extensively from the Bible, and continuing to use Christian devotional styles. In much of this they were supported by Abdul Baha, who took an active role in the process of reformulation, addressing Western religious and social concerns in Baha'i terms in his conversations with Western pilgrims, his letters to the Western Baha'is, and his talks during his tours of Europe and North America in 1911 to 1913. Abdul Baha's own personal presence and the enormous devotion which he received from so many of his Western followers also acted to consolidate and dynamize the fledgling Baha'i communities. Initially, the identification, adamantly repudiated by Abdul Baha, which many early American Baha'is made between Abdul Baha and Jesus Christ, also acted as an important cultural bridge. The other major changes linked to expansion during this period were the twin developments of the system of Baha'i administration from 1922 onwards and systematic planning from 1937 on. The developing administrative system saw elected local and national Baha'i councils, spiritual assemblies in Baha'i parlance, becoming the directive agencies for organized Baha'i activities, whilst the various plans gave the Baha'is specific goals of expansion to accomplish. Both of these developments were rooted in earlier periods of Baha'i history, but were given fresh emphasis and form by Shaqi Effendi. The Western Baha'is, particularly those of the United States, took the lead in both developments. Unlike the Baha'is of the Middle East, the Western Baha'is enjoyed conditions of religious freedom and material opportunity 
which enabled them to accomplish shocky offenders' objectives with relative ease, although often also with much personal sacrifice. Shirky Effendi's expansion plans called for an extension of Baha'i teaching activities, the settlement of pioneer Baha'i teachers in those territories in which there were as yet no Baha'is, the establishment of local and national spiritual assemblies, the acquisition of Baha'i properties such as temple sites and administrative headquarters, the translation of Baha'i literature into an increasing range of languages, and the gradual completion of the Baha'i House of Worship in Wilmette, near Chicago, regarded as the premier Baha'i edifice in the West. Initially, the plans were assigned individually to each National Spiritual Assembly, seven by the late 1930s, eleven by 1951, aiming for the expansion of each community's home front in size and geographical extent, as well as following a strategy of global expansion. Thus, American and Canadian Baha'is were required to establish the faith in Latin America and the Caribbean in two successive plans from 1937 to 1953, and subsequently in those areas of post-war Western Europe in which there were few or no Baha'is. Meanwhile, the Baha'is of India and Burma were directed to Southeast Asia, the Iranians to Afghanistan and the Arab world, the Egyptians to North Africa, and the British, in concert with all of the above, to Africa. The success of this collaborative Inter-Assembly Africa project heralded the launching of the Ten-Year Crusade from 1953 to 1963, which, by the extent and magnitude of its accomplishments, marked the beginning of a new stage of Baha'i growth, which I will discuss in the next video. In terms of geographical diffusion and administrative expansion, the results of these early plans were impressive. In 1935, Baha'is had resided in 1,034 places in the world, 139 of which had local spiritual assemblies. By 1952, these figures had risen to 2,425 localities and 611 local assemblies. Thank you.